Welcome to the 36th episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be speaking to Susan, Suzanne uh, Ziedijk. Uh, Dr. Ziedijk is a research scientist fascinated by babies' innate capaci capacity to connect. Since 1993, she has been based at the University of Dundee in Scotland uh, within the School of Psychology and she now holds an honorary position there. Her academic career began in the USA, where she completed her PhD at Yale University. Suzanne's core aspiration continues to be strengthening awareness of the decisions we take about caring for our children, because those choices are in integrally connected to our vision for the kind of society we wish to build. Welcome, Suzanne. Cheers. I am delighted to be with you today. Really, really pleased to be mm. boarding school. Mm, thank you. Yeah, so we, we met each other on a, a boarding school workshop. We did. And it's, you know, I've been fascinated by attachment theory for a number of years. And I thought, oh, it'd be lovely to speak to someone. And then we reached, we kind of connected on the workshop. And then you said, oh, yeah, I'd be up for speaking about this. So here we are. I remember that very fondly because when you could see all the faces of the folks who were on that, mm -hmm. uh, me messaging you privately and inside I was thinking, oh, Piers, Piers Cross is here. And so <laughs> the ability to um, message you privately and go, Piers, I don't, you won't know who I am, but I follow your work was a real delight for me. And then it's led to this. So mm. fantastic yeah thank you thank you yeah it's kind of fascinating um yeah that the message is getting out there more and more about boarding school and i feel that what we're going to talk about today i feel is really important because your work with aces you know, the adverse childhood experiences um and also trauma attachment theory just really ties into to this conversation about boarding school before we get into that, I would love you to tell us a little bit about your background and how you became interested in this topic. Oh, that's a great place to start. Well, I am, as you've already said, a developmental psychologist. Um, and lots of people don't know what one of those is. And what, so when you do psychology, you can focus on lots of different things like social processes or cognitive processes. Um, how the brain develops, so you could do neuropsychology. When I got interested in psychology, I got interested in human development. So how things change over time, and in particular, how your experiences as a child, as a baby, even uh, before being born, impact on how you develop and who you become. And so I'm interested in a whole wide range of of questions about what kinds of experiences can children and babies have. And I just think that by and large, we don't think about these things as a society. Mm. Our society doesn't encourage us to think about them. And whatever you experience feels normal and feel and kind of like has to be okay. Like, why would you have something that's normal that's not good for children? Mm. And if you start to think, oh, that's maybe that's not very good for my child. Maybe that wasn't very good for me. That's an uncomfortable question. Yeah. And so when I, so that I went on to then become an academic mm -hmm. and a um, bit over 10 years ago now, I decided I really wanted the public to understand the science that I understood. I I love being a scientist. I love collecting data. I love publishing basic research. And I list all of that right now because it helps the general public to go, how do we come to know things about anything? How does the business of science work? Mm -hmm. And a lot of that science is created by academics who okay. think up questions to ask and then obtain funding to ask those questions and then get their research published. But that research doesn't always reach the public. In fact, usually doesn't reach the public. And so science knows 
a lot of things that are helpful about what helps children to thrive. And sometimes science has got that wrong as well. Yeah, yeah. But, but the link between what science knows and what the public would benefit from knowing is really fragile. Mm. And so I stepped away from a full-time academic career about a decade ago now in order to try to bring what I call the science of connection to the, to the wider public. And part of my interest amongst a whole lot of other experiences that children could have is what happens if your experience is a boarding school? How does that shape you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank I think you. it's endlessly fascinating. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and I find, you know, we'll move into that a bit. I find it fascinating that somebody who, um, who started the movement, John Bal Balby, was an ex-boarder himself. Uh, absolutely. So I'm sure we'll come back to this. You can, mm. you can start in the story in lots of places. So you could start with publication of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study in 1998, mm. um, which more and more people now know about. You could start with the developing understanding of trauma, mm. which, um, Oh, you know, which started in 1980s. Mm -hmm. You could start with the development of interest in boarding school, which mm -hmm. starts in the 1990s with Nick Duffel and Joy Shavron's work. Mm -hmm. You can go all the way back to the 1930s, the development of attachment research with John Bowlby. Mm -hmm. So if you get interested in trauma, mm -hmm. in childhood trauma, in... Uh, in the trauma of boarding school, which is surprising to many people, um, in attach you can start that story in, in all sorts of places. One of the things I find is that there has been a lot of interest in trauma, a lot of interest in, in attachment and adverse childhood experiences, mm -hmm. but that that has stayed kind of separate from boarding school. Mm -hmm. That boarding thinking about boarding school as a trauma mm. has not really been included in that wider movement. Mm. And I think that's really interesting. And I have thought a lot about why I think that is. And I, I hope we'll come back to that. Mm. Just to start by highlighting, we have known a lot of things about the importance of relationships. Yeah. And that has not always factored into the way our society operates or the systems within our society. Mm, mm, mm. thank you thank you yeah i mean that was our kind of second question was about the rise of the trauma movement and i feel you know i was reading your publication one of your uh, documents you'd written about trauma and i was surprised that it was only really 2015 that it's suddenly been receiving a lot more publicity well pierce that's a I mean, I'm just going to probably keep saying that. That's an interesting question. That's an interesting question. <laughs> because there are some really important, interesting questions to ask. How did that happen in all of this? Mm -hmm. So let's go back to some of the history of that. Yeah. And other people might tell the history slightly differently, but you have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. John Bowlby starts to do his work on the importance of infancy in the 19 late 1930s, which is World War II. Yeah. And then that grows into a really systematic science by the 1970s. Hmm. And yes, there are big debates about um, attachment research. And if, if we had a variety of people here, uh, we could have other interesting discussions about where are some of the gaps in that. Hmm. But he provides really um, novel and robust evidence about the importance of early childhood mm -hmm. and works out some of the details of that around separation anxiety. And, okay. Uh, in um, going alongside is a lot of interest in child maltreatment by the time we get to the 1970s and definitely by the 1980s. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't reach the general public because those are the... Those are the mistreated children, the maltreated children. Yeah. So yeah. we kind of see them as something 
kind of different than normal children, mm -hmm. non maltreated children. What language should we use? So you might have thought, okay, so Bowlby is doing normal childhood, and then we've got a scientific literature on maltreated children. Mm -hmm. um, by the 19, by in 1998, uh, Feliti and Anda publish a study now known to many people as the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Mm -hmm. They were medics, but most people don't really notice their study. So it's in, you know, it's like post 2010, 2015, 2017, wow. 2000, you know, to the mid 2000, 2010s, mm -hmm. that the wider public starts to think more about trauma. So we have known all of this stuff for decades, but it didn't make it out to the wider public. And why is that? Well, depending on which language you use, attachment, trauma, ACEs, mm -hmm. I have now used three different forms, you know, three different terms. I want to throw in the term of suffering, mm -hmm. which is not very scientific, but I now talk about that a lot so that we can think about children's and babies' experiences of the world. It is because of adverse childhood experiences that the wider public really seems to be understanding this. Um, James Redford makes a film called Resilience, which comes out in about 2015, 2016. And that makes that science that was originally published in 1998, accessible to the general public. So I think a, it wasn't a scientific publication, but a filmmaker who helps to translate this for the wider public. Um, in, in Scotland, where I am based, that film came to the general public in 2017 and it had a dramatic impact on the conversations we had across Scotland. Uh, that film went to 25 different communities across Scotland, almost by accident. It was because people wanted to see it. And so I and Tina Hendry took that film all over the country uh, to communities that wanted it. And the reason I think that some of this detail is worth telling is that it lets us ask, how do you start to get a public awareness of a new idea? How did we come to the view that we needed seat belts? Because mm -hmm. once upon a time, you had cars without seat belts. Now most people would say seat belts are pretty important. How did that happen? Once upon a time, not that long ago, uh, driving while you were intoxicated happened a lot. How did it happen that that changed? And most people now think that that's not a good idea. Okay. For a long time, we have been giving our children experiences that turn out to not be very good for them, that turn out to be dangerous for their development. When do we start to ask the question, what do our children really need? And how do we deal with the discomfort that that question brings? So partly, we're not just talking about the science of what children need, but how you, how you talk about that, how you get wider interest in that, beyond just the scientists. I am in my heart a scientist, but I got to a point where I thought it was not okay that it was the scientists who knew most about this. I thought the wider public deserved to share in those discussions. How do we help that to happen? And some of that then gets asked about boarding school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was at your uh, talk a few weeks ago and um, hearing, I heard you talk about going to these 25 communities and also this connection with people like John Carnegie. I think yes. that's a, yes. a, who's the police officer who brought attachment theory into policing. And it's like, wow. Yeah, see what a great impact you've had by doing this work. I just feel hugely privileged to do this work. Mm. And I think all of those voices matter a lot. Mm. 
people can talk about how they have put this knowledge into practice in their sector, in their professional life, in their personal life. Because then you have a better sense of why it matters and how it matters. So John Carnican, who mm -hmm. you just mentioned, um, is a police officer. And he brought his growing understanding of the importance of children's experiences and warm, attuned relationships to his understanding of violence. He works in Glasgow. If you want to reduce violence, how do you do that? He no longer wanted to keep locking people up. He wanted to reduce the violence that he saw in Glasgow. And, he, and his understanding of trauma, ACEs, attachment, helped him to realize that we needed to think earlier about children's experiences rather than just locking up the bad guys. So to hear that story from a police officer is quite powerful. If you then hear, um, and so he formed the violence reduction unit with Karen McCluskey. And then you can think, how did he do that? Who allowed him to do that? Who changed his job description? So he tells the story of Willie Ray, who was his boss, who said, yes, I'm going to give you time to think about uh, violence differently. And although most people won't want to remember the story of Willie Ray because it's not really relevant to their lives, I think it's helpful to remember that somebody had to say to him, I'll let you do that. So some leader in his organization was willing to get curious and brave and rethink his job description and Karen McCluskey's job description. Okay. Once you think, oh, that has to happen, then you can go, what about in schools? There are tons of school teachers who are now interested in the impact of trauma and adverse childhood experiences and attachment. But not all schools are. So then you realize, okay, so there are head teachers who need to go, maybe we need to rethink our behavior policy. Mm. Maybe we, re we need to rethink behavior charts on the wall or isolation rooms. There are lots of schools who use isolation rooms as a punishment for bad behavior. To hear the stories that there are other schools who have decided to question themselves mm -hmm. and to hear the stories told by those head teachers matters. And then you can start to ripple it out. Social work, business, early years, parents. You can start to think, okay, so there are lots of sectors mm -hmm. that this information could apply to mm -hmm. and that we could make things better for people if that's what we want to do. Boarding school is one of those sectors. Yeah. But each sector means that you have to think out the details of how your sector operates and what your sector thinks it's doing and particularly what it thinks it's doing well. So we'll come back in a minute to parents don't send their children off to boarding school thinking I will wreck my child's life. I will cause problems for my child later in adulthood. Parents send their children off to boarding school thinking that they're doing something valuable for them. Mm -hmm. So how do you cope then with the sense that there are some people saying that might not have been so good for your child? That rage is huge feelings. Mm -hmm. But I have discovered that there are always huge feelings in this process of understanding. So if it's a, you, there are lots of things you can discover that as a parent that you did for good reason and well-intentioned that might have had impacts that you didn't know, that the police think. So the number of police officers that I now know that say, if I had known this, it would really have changed the way I operated as a, as a police officer. Mm -hmm. There are business owners that say, if I had understood the impact of childhood on the way that my employees cope mm -hmm. with some of the experiences of being a member of a team or getting there on time or c communicating with other people. I might have had different policies within my organization. Mm -hmm. So I hope that it is helpful to place boarding school 
within this wider framework rather than set it apart as something separate from a whole lot of other things that happen to non-boarding school children. Mm -hmm. I think that changes the way you see both boarding school experiences Mm -hmm. and also the way you see child development in non-boarding school experiences. So we bring them together. Mm -hmm. It tells us a new story that we haven't been thinking about even since the 1990s when boarding school survivor syndrome began to be talked about by Nick Duffel and Joy Shavlin. Mm, thank you. Is that you. helpful? Tell me what you think about Yeah, that. yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I, when I hear people talk, I get new questions. So I like to come back to the questions. But then what comes to me, which is fascinating, is you're talking about boarding school being separated off from other traumas. But I also feel that boarding school, you also there's also a separation that those who had a difficult time and then those who just had boarding school experiences and i often hear that from ex-boarders certainly their partners saying you know i'm really struggling with my partner but he says he had a wonderful time of course <laughs> and there there are those a small percentage you saying actually it was terrible and i would love to open the conversation today at some point uh well actually what is this you know is that separation at age four six eight eleven is actually that a a trauma so as children we have experiences Mm -hmm. that we need to cope with in order to live with our family because you can't just walk out the door yeah you think it's normal as a child whatever you experience you think is normal even if it is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make sense of it. You have to come to terms with it. And one way to describe what happens for children is that you think I deserve this, Mm -hmm. that love is painful, but that just must be what love is. Love is anxious, but that's what being a member of my family, it must just mean that it's supposed to be anxious. But I am putting these adult words and adult frames around experiences that cannot be named when you're really young. So infancy, early childhood is full of uncomfortable experiences Mm -hmm. that are uncomfortable in the body. Loneliness, sadness, fear, terror, humiliation, uncertainty. Does someone come and help you with those because they tune into what you're feeling Mm -hmm. or do they leave you on your own with it? Do the people who you depend on actually cause some of that? That's effectively called attachment. Mm -hmm. And so we learn before we can ever walk or talk or have any conscious memory of it, how trustworthy other people are in coming to help us when things are uncomfortable and something like 40 to 50 percent of the British population learn that people don't always tune in to your needs Mm. that your adults aren't very attuned to when you are uncomfortable that's called attachment And and parents don't do that because they're intending not to pay attention to you they do it because they are overwhelmed by your need of them. They do it because they've been taught that um, that you should let children cry because their culture taught them that. But I'm just trying to come up with ordinary examples of what happens from really early ages. And then extrapolate that to, to as you grow up. Here's another example. We come from a culture that says that when two-year-olds throw themselves on the ground and have what we call a temper tantrum, we think they're badly behaved. Mm -hmm. We don't understand that they have been overwhelmed by really big feelings with a stress system that is not yet fully developed. So if your stress system is fragile and immature, Mm -hmm. 
You can't handle big feelings. If your brain is not yet knitted up with neural pathways, you can't make sense of big feelings. You need someone's help because mm -hmm. you got overwhelmed by the fact that the mummy just said you can't have the chocolate. Mm -hmm. And let, you know, let me just play that up for a moment. What do you mean I can't have the chocolate? But you're, you're my mom and you said you love me and somebody's put the chocolate right here at my level and I really have a strong desire for the chocolate and you have betrayed me because you just said I can't have the chocolate. I'm trying to make it funny so that we can kind of laugh, mm -hmm. so that we can look at the suffering that is caused to a child by all of those conflicting emotions. And of course, it can be anything. It can be, I asked for cereal this morning, and I'm really excited about the cereal, and I want to eat the cereal myself, and you let me pour in the milk, but you've now stored, stirred in the sugar. And I am overwhelmed with fury at you that you stirred the sugar. And so I have a temper tantrum because I'm overwhelmed. In our culture, we call the behavior that results from that overwhelm a temper tantrum. And we see it as badly behaved, and we're taught that children should be punished for that. And it's worse if you're having that temper tantrum in public, where I see that other adults are judging me for the fact I can't keep my child under control. Okay. All of those are examples of what happens early in life. And since you want your parents to love you, you have to find a way of making sense of the fact that your mom or your dad wasn't very nice to you when you were overwhelmed by big feelings. And so you, you forget about it. You repress them. You squash them. You forget that in that moment you hated your parents. And you develop those emotional processes that are needed for staying in your family so that you will be loved. Okay, if you are sent off to boarding school a little bit later, but you want to stay part of your family, you want to belong because that belonging, that search for belonging is a basic human need. That's attachment. But you hate being at boarding school. You have to find some way putting the, together the fact that you hate boarding school, but your parents say you have to stay mm -hmm. in a way that lets you still remember, remain a member of your family. One way to handle that is you oppress all of that. So your boarding school, to go back to your question, mm -hmm. your boarding school experience may have resulted in all sorts of consequences that you don't even recognize that you have no conscious memory of how uncomfortable it was and the emotional accommodations that you had to make. Mm -hmm. But that mean that you're not very able to understand other people's emotions, to tune into their emotions. So it causes problems in your adult relationship that other people can see, but that you don't see yourself and that you can't make sense of. So what I'm trying to say is that the example you gave that a partner can say, I can see that you are struggling, but you said you had a great time at boarding school, hmm. which absolutely makes sense. And the partner saying, yes, I had a great time at boarding school. Stop bothering me with all of these things that you think I'm struggling with. I don't really want to talk about that because that makes me uncomfortable. All of that is ordinary and normal. That's the key thing I'm trying to say here is that those are ordinary developmental processes and they help us to understand how all children develop and how lots of children bring suffering and difficulties into their adulthood that they don't know about. It's just that not all children had the particular suffering of going off to, to boarding school. Mm -hmm. And can I add one other thing? There cool. will be some people listening to this that go, but actually going to boarding school was really good for me because life at home was not good. Mm -hmm. Do you know what? That will be true too. And in other words, does our suffering get as children, 
get attended to by adults or not. Mm. And if it doesn't get attended to, then difficult emotional consequences flow from that and we carry them into our adulthood. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Here's, yeah. I know I've said a lot there. Yeah. But I guess one of the messages that I would like to come out of this is, is the boarding school for all that, for some people, it's really weird. Mm -hmm. right? And I hope that's helpful. I hope that's a helpful word to use. I know lots of families who go, why on earth would you send your kid to boarding school? I don't know how parents can do that. Mm -hmm. So for people who didn't go to boarding school, that can seem a really weird way to bring up your kids. Mm -hmm. But if you come from a culture where that's normal, then that's what you do. It's not weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that contrast actually helps us to see developmental processes more clearly. Because if you went to, if you went into care, if you were removed from your parents because they were judged by the state and social workers not to be able to care for their children adequately, That's another experience, another impact on developmental processes that once upon a time wasn't thought about either. Yeah. More thinking has gone into how care experience um, disrupts healthy emotional development. Mm -hmm. So we've done more thinking about that now. Mm -hmm. But once upon a time, we didn't. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, that wasn't thought about by the system at all. And of course, in America, there's now discussion going on about should um, should we increase the number of children who babies who are born so that they could be put into adoption, right? So that conversation that is happening in America right now is not informed through a trauma lens. Okay, as soon as I say that, it, I totally understand it's possible to go, wait a second, Suzanne, we're not talking about care experience children today we're talking about children in boarding school. Mm. No, from my perspective, we're talking about all those children, it, in, including children who did not have attachment disruptions. I think we're talking about human beings yeah. who start as babies, who develop and have experiences, especially of relationships, but also other experiences like play, violence in communities, um, pollution in the air, mm -hmm. it, emotional, physiological um, experiences, if you call pollution an experience, that will sound strange, but if you grow up in an environment where there is not pollution, mm -hmm. it has a different impact on your physiology. Yeah. Those experiences change our bodies and the way we cope with adulthood. And so I think that having a whole range of experiences that you can have as a human being, and bringing those together helps us to begin to better understand that. Mm -hmm. Boarding school is one of the experiences in, in that, you know, in that range. Mm. It's just not one that we have thought very much about because the kids who get sent to boarding school are the privileged kids. Mm. And the privileged kids can't be traumatized. Mm. It's the kids who live in the in the deprived communities or the kids in care, you know, or the kids who live in dysfunctional families. Mm. And since in Britain we have perceived children who go to boarding school as privileged children, we have, I think, tended not to pay very much attention to that particular source of trauma. Yeah, yeah. I think as ex-boarders, a lot of us can feel a lot of shame that we went because we want to fit in, but you know, 
I remember me going back home because I can't remember who I heard speak about that, but you go to board, it's almost like you've left home. So you come home, you're just a visitor, visitor, and therefore your friends who you had before, they're leading different lives. So you, you want to fit back in, but people, you know, I've heard many stories over the years of people being bullied because they were the rich uh, kid. And I remember in my 20s when I told someone, who I met from my local town um he'd wanted to go to boarding school and he went for local comprehensive and he hated me in my 20s going you're such a privilege I said no actually it wasn't quite as nice as as that you know but there's often I hear this from people there's shame that we've gone Piers I think that is fascinating and I think if all of us who are interested in trauma and indeed the people who are not interested in trauma but that need to be interested in trauma mm -hmm. can think more about how as a society we in, endorse some forms of trauma mm -hmm. we don't endorse others so there's a status in the trauma field if that makes sense mm -hmm. That people are often unaware of but that i hope the aces movement or the mm. trauma movement will help us to think about mm. so uh, just to confirm the aces is adverse childhood experiences just if people yeah so so Felidia and anda who i mentioned in mm. a, a little bit ago published a study in 1998 called the adverse childhood experiences study and what they were trying to show in that was that if you had what they called adverse childhood experiences like um, you had a parent who with a mental illness, you had a parent in prison, you had a parent with alcohol or drug abuse problem, you suffered emotional abuse or physical abuse or sexual abuse or emotional neglect. So they identified some key experiences that you could have as a child that they were able to demonstrate had an impact on your adulthood like it particularly um what we would think of as medical problems so um heart disease liver disease diabetes and lots of people will go what what have diabetes got to do with emotional abuse in childhood precisely what does what is the relationship between those that is not typically how we think of the source of heart problems or liver disease problems or diabetes, we do not think of that as childhood trauma. That is like a mind blowing idea. But that's what they were able to offer to this wider discussion, that childhood trauma can stay in your body and change your physiology so that it has an impact in adulthood. Yes. <laughs> Yes. So another thing we could have called trauma, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, we could simply call it human development. Yeah. We could call it child development. Mm -hmm. But somehow, we that sounds really different to us, right? When you go child development, that doesn't sound like trauma, mm -hmm. except that many children have traumatic experiences in their development. And that changes the way their body functions, that changes the way their stress system functions, that changes the way literally the neural pathways in their brain are formed. Mm -hmm. That is fascinating and scary. Mm -hmm. Because if you learn that as a parent and you discover that there are things you did to your child, that you had no idea what was going to damage them. If damage is the right word, if trauma is the right word. So then we get tied up in linguistic tangles. How could, and I know I'm jumping around, but I hope that helps us. How could sending my child off to boarding school be a trauma? That can't count as a trauma. Mm -hmm. 
okay, I know they might have struggled a wee bit at the beginning, but that's just the process of boarding school. You struggle at the beginning. You're a bit homesick. Oh, see, look at your face. Right? But then you get over it. Okay, <laughs> your peers, your face tells me you didn't really get over it. Am I right? Well, yeah, yeah. I was just talking about that in the article I, I wrote uh, in the Telegraph. This uh, this idea that you know, in my twenties, I tried to commit suicide a few times, and it was like, why? And then as I started to unpick, I read Nick Duffel's book, The Making of Them. It was like, oh, okay, this makes sense now. To many people. Well, you just didn't get on at boarding school very well, were you? You weren't a very good boarding school pupil because mm -hmm. the good boarding school pupils wouldn't have had the problems that you had, right? So the mm -hmm. idea mm -hmm. that you could have attempted suicide mm -hmm. in your early 20s and that that could have something to do with your childhood experiences that your parents paid for mm -hmm. is deeply unsettling. Mm -hmm. all sorts of people especially you <laughs> yeah. and yet beyond you right so it's un i mean obviously i have never met your parents mm -hmm. but if you're and i have no idea and let's just hold that for a moment let's let everybody listening to this wonder what your parents did would have done if they had understood that an experience they had given to you had led you in some way to wish to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. it's, an, it's a more extreme version of what I find many parents ask themselves. Oh my gosh, yeah. did something that I did to my child undermine their happiness? That is a very scary question to ask. And so many parents can't ask that and they, they close down that. They move into denial. That, um, well, what I was doing was well-intentioned. Okay, but what do you do with the idea that something that I did that was well-intentioned had a really negative impact on you? So all parents end up asking themselves those questions if they are brave enough to, if they have what I call fierce curiosity, mm -hmm. because that's a really uncomfortable question to ask. When I was just doing what was normal for my culture. So facing up to, I could have done something to my child that was painful for them is hard for parents. Okay. Boarding school children and parents carry an extra layer. They paid for that to have happened. Mm -hmm. So that's even harder for many parents to face up to. And for the children to face up to. So Nick Duffel calls that privileged abandonment. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to feel grateful for the things that happened to you in boarding school because your parents chose that for you and they paid a lot of money for it. And so if you're a child in care, mm -hmm. you got removed from your family because the state took you away, you don't have that complication, right? In fact, you can be angry at the state mm -hmm. you, that, that they removed you from your family. Many people in care are angry at the state because they removed them. The mm -hmm. parents can be angry at them because they took away their child. Yeah. The, you might be grateful to the state because they removed you from a circumstance that was awful. Boarding school families have a different kind of tangle. Mm -hmm. The parents spent a lot of money to send you away, to offer you something that they thought would be good for you, that they thought was normal, that they thought um, that they were giving you long-term things like access to power in Britain, mm -hmm. access to status that they thought was valuable and that they wanted for you, money, a good job. Mm -hmm. The idea that that came with childhood suffering is really hard to face up to. Mm 
So the parents can't face it, especially if it's tied into a whole cultural way of operating. We have a whole system. Mm -hmm. We have class attached to this in, in Britain. Mm -hmm. And to come all the way back to the children, it's really hard to talk about your suffering if you're supposed to have been grateful for it. That's called shame. Yeah. And so it is the privileged abandonment element of this that other sectors don't have, don't experience, that I think boarding school really adds to our understanding of, of trauma mm -hmm. and why it's particularly hard to untangle that because it's layered with you had something that was good for you and that was valuable. Why are you complaining about it? You can't complain to your parents. You can't complain to yourself. You can't complain to the culture that you were brought up to be in. And you can't complain like to your friend mm -hmm. who wanted to go to boarding school, who doesn't want to hear about how it was suffering for you because you're privileged and you had enough money to go. Mm -hmm. so I'm being, making space to talk about trauma and shame and childhood suffering is hard for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm hearing that it's important to do, to be able to speak. I think it's immensely important mm -hmm. as a culture. We damage people's capacities to live full, thriving, emotionally fulfilling lives mm -hmm. because of the way we treat our children. And it isn't, for the most part, it is not done because you're trying to do that. Parents and systems are trying to do their best for children. Mm -hmm. I believe that. It's just that if we don't pay attention to ch childhood suffering, if we don't pay attention to the kinds of treatment they need, the kinds of relationships they need, the normal, ordinary things damage children. Mm -hmm. And then change who they are as adults and if you have enough damaged adults that's called a culture and then you can struggle but you can make decisions for other people who also cause them to struggle so this is where you know another place where it gets edgy if we have lots of people in government who had boarding school experiences and boarding school damages Right, we're back to the point, does boarding school damage? Mm -hmm. The point of this conversation is that boarding school damages many people. Yeah. That means we have lots of people in very powerful positions in Britain who are emotionally damaged, mm -hmm. making policy that shapes the lives of everybody in the country. And some of those policies that have been decided in the last few years are incredibly cruel. So we live in a country right now that is happy for people to go hungry, for people to go cold, for people not to be able to visit their loved ones as they died during COVID lockdown. That's what Partygate is about. Partygate is about the lack of empathy, of understanding the everyone's suffering. Well, if you've been sent to have experiences that decrease your empathy for other people, your capacity for empathy, that is not surprising. No wonder we have cruel policies. So I think it's really important that we understand this and that we be able to talk about it and that we be able to have fierce curiosity Mm. about questions that are deeply uncomfortable to ask yeah. so that we can think about the kind of world we want to have and about some of the brave actions that will be taken for this because there will not be everybody who is glad that I am saying what I'm saying. There mm. will be some people who are celebrating this. Yeah. There will be lots well. of other people <laughs> who find what I'm saying inconvenient. Yeah, yeah. We need to understand the inconvenience of this mm -hmm. 
as well as the pain of this in order to make changes so that we can give our children the experiences that allow them to thrive. Mm -hmm. If there is still time, I think that part of the reason we have not been able to face up to climate change is for some of these same reasons. It's, we like to live in denial as human beings. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that we have done ourselves out of a planet that we can live on. Mm. The planet will survive, but we won't. Mm -hmm. Some of that, the reasons that we have done that is because we're not able to, we don't, we have raised ourselves and our children in ways that stop the cognitive capacity to think about questions that are deeply uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, so I can go really big. I'm now talking climate change, mm -hmm. or I can start to narrow in to systems like care, boarding school, uh, inequality, and then I can make it narrower, narrower, narrower to mm -hmm. how do you respond to your child when you're in the, you know, when you're in Asda's Wait Rose Safeway on a street, how do you respond as a individual parent mm. all the way, what do we do as a you know as societies or as a human species for mm. me the capacity to reflect and to relate to others to see others pain and suffering mm. the capacities to do those things are embedded in how we were treated as children mm. and the capacity to heal down the line if you didn't get those experiences i do not mean that it's that you're locked into what happened to you as a child mm. you can heal from that. Mm. But first you have to get curious enough to think, what am I struggling with? Mm. And lots of people live their lives where they are unable to thrive, having no idea that it could have got better. They mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as you speak, I've got hundreds of little threads. I'm like, Ooh, yeah, you could talk about that. So, you know, I'd love to hear what you feel about you know how we deal with the child in the supermarket and as you speak that i realized that you know it's what i'm hearing from you speak is as children it's important for us to have as many experiences as possible some might be difficult but then we have the adult or adults because you know they say this in the african proverb it takes a a, a village to bring up a, a child and i noticed that for me boarding school or care you do not, you know, it's 50 boys or 50 girls to one adult. And therefore, you do not have an adult there to help you through that. So, yeah. It's a great example. So, people who went to boarding school are really important in this discussion. Mm -hmm. Wide societal discussion. Because people who did not go to boarding school don't really know what it's like. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the stories that we have make it sound like, you know, jolly japes make it sound great. Mm -hmm. Harry Potter makes boarding school sound fantastic. And I say that as a JK Rowling fan, mm -hmm. right? I think mm -hmm. Harry Potter, the Harry Potter series, I'm delighted that they've been written. Not I love them as well. Them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying real boarding school might not have been like that story. Mm -hmm. So you end in, so the descriptions by people who went to boarding school about what it was like matter. Now, some people will provide descriptions that say it was all wonderful. Okay. But there's a whole lot of people like you who are able to go, actually, it wasn't wonderful. It was full of humiliation. You're not allowed to cry. You're not allowed to miss your parents. So the people who are writing biographies, and there are a lot of them now. So Richard Beard, uh, Alex Renton, um, Robert Verkay, Musa Akwanga. There are lots of boarding school biographies now. Uh, Tony Gamage. Mm -hmm. And I want to chuck him in because Tony didn't write a book. Tony made a film. Oh, that's powerful. And you've interviewed Tony. Mm -hmm. uh, Simon Partridge. Mm -hmm. Joanna Britton. 
I'm just trying to name lots of names so that other people who might want to go read their accounts or, or watch their accounts know that there are stories out there to be told. And there are lots of others as well. Mm -hmm. um, those people have been able to reflect on what happened to them and start to say there's quite a lot of really awful experiences in that. So if I cried missing my parents, um, I, I was not allowed to cry. The other boys or girls in my room, in my dorm, made fun of me. Um, there are lots of stories of physical violence if you cried missing your parents, being tipped out of your bed, being hit, being caned, being strapped. Um, the, the teddy bear you brought with you, stolen, chucked out the window, hung. People who didn't go to boarding school don't know that stuff happens. That's why those biographies matter, mm -hmm. right? You're like, they what? Yes, you were not allowed to cry for missing your child, for, by, for missing your parents. So many, and you know, young children, so I'm talking six, seven, eight-year-olds who are in a dorm with other boys that they know that will be listening to them and they're racked with sobs for meeting their, for missing their parents. They kind of learn to almost not breathe. You have to squash those tears. You have to repress those feelings because not only is the grief of missing your parents present, the threat that you'll be beat up for it is present. So the only, where can you deal with those feelings? Well, where will you get some privacy? Maybe you could go to the loo. Okay, I have to squash all of those feelings until I get to a private place. And then if I do cry, I'll have to not cry aloud because people will be able to hear me crying. And that's like in a cubicle. Of course, if you're a boy, you're standing at the urinals. You don't even, you have no privacy for dealing with big feelings. So what do you do with them? You squash them. Of course you do. Otherwise you cannot function. And you're expected to function in this new place that you've been sent to. I think it is remarkable and fascinating that the human psyche can do that. You can take terror, you can squash it. You can squash it so much, you don't even have an awareness yourself anymore that you're experiencing it. You can make it disappear from conscious awareness. But that does not mean it does not exist. And that does not mean that it isn't lodged somewhere in your stress system. Mm. So that later on, when you grow up and you've had to repress all of those feelings, when your child has feelings about something they don't want and they express it, maybe they cry, you can't bear that. Mm. Your stress system can't bear that because you get triggered. So you're not able to attend to your child's feelings. You're not able to help your child with their big feelings. In fact, you might make it worse. You might humiliate them and tell them, don't be silly. I got, I got over missing my parents. You will too. Your, parent, your feelings aren't heard. You might, you might get really angry. Don't you dare say that to me. You know how you're supposed to behave. Um, you might just walk away. So you can't meet your children's needs because those, those needs have not been he healed in you. They've not been paid attention to in the child that you once were. Mm -hmm. And it can ripple through generation after generation after generation until someone in the family cycle decides to get courageous enough to, and fiercely curious enough to look at things from a new perspective. And if you have drawn benefits from that, you might not want to do that. Yeah. We have all sorts of people who have power and status and nice houses and cars. Those are desirable things. Why would you look at pain if pain bought you those things? Why would you do that? Mm 
So that helps us to begin to understand where some of the stumbling blocks to solving this are. Mm -hmm. And yet, we have a society where people are going cold and hungry. Mm -hmm. Who, the, the conditions for that were created by people who are not very good at attending to the suffering by other people. Mm -hmm. If we understand how that becomes woven into power, into class, maybe we have a chance of, of creating some different circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. And at, at some point, I'd love for us to, to explore that about the future. You know, at the beginning, I mentioned before we started recording, doing this film, the three stages, I'd love to see and hear your vision about how we do heal that because i feel like you say we're i feel a real choice point at the moment on earth with the environment and and i feel my feeling is we can do this but those people in power need to do that in the healing work they need to kind of see and i guess what a question i have here is like I see that people who say, oh, yeah, boarding school was traumatic or I had childhood trauma, somehow see that there's weakness. Now, I'd love to restart to reframe this. And maybe this is one of the solution is to start to see that Robert Bly, who wrote the book, Iron John, saying that it is where our wound is, is where our genius lies. And if we can reframe that, actually, guys, you've been to this boarding school. This was your gift if you open up speak about it but yeah i'd love to hear what you feel here's i would love that if the more people who get interested in where they struggle in life and in where they cause struggles to other people we need to be interested in both but Tons of people do not want to do either of those things. It is uncomfortable. You spent years in therapy. Therapy gets you to face uncomfortable things. It also gives you a freedom. It gives you a contentment. It gives you the capacity <clears throat> to contribute to the world in a different way. But lots of people don't want that. Lots of people... It's too hard to start to untangle who you are. And if you are benefiting in ways that are perfectly happy for you, you have enough houses, you have enough cars, you get to go to the parties that you want to, why would you reflect on any of that? You, you think your life is happy and you're not very aware, maybe not even concerned about the ways in which other people's lives are not happy from your actions. Okay, so not everybody is going to want to do that. Yeah. Right. So one of the things that we all need to be aware of is who are the people who are dangerous that we need to be wiser about and to think more deeply about the consequences that they can't hear you. They can't hear me. And like at some level... They don't really care about my suffering. We need to not expect that they will care about my suffering. I need to get wiser about who is interested in my suffering and who is not. And then make political decisions or cultural decisions or personal decisions that keep me safer and that keep the the people around me safer in other words if you elect people who make policy that say it's okay for people to be cold and hungry i would rather we did not elect those people and to understand that there are you know there are lots of people who don't see the suffering of other people one of Alex Renton's books is about boarding school. Mm -hmm. And one of 
the books he wrote after that is about slavery. Yeah. And part of his point in that book is that the suffering of traumatized people, you know, kidnapped from Africa and put into slave labor was not seen by the plantation owners and the land owners. Their suffering was not seen. They were treated as farm animals. Okay, let's get really curious and think, what do you have to do to ignore the suffering of people that you hold in slavery? Mm -hmm. How does that happen? Well, that happens a lot. That's through othering. Othering, lots of us human beings can do. Yeah. Okay, we are othered. And by that, I mean the British, you know, lots of the British population, the citizenry, are othered by our government. Our suffering doesn't matter, or you would make different policy. Yeah. Okay, so being aware of the way in which other people can be dangerous and that they cannot hear you because that has been... Uh, that capacity has not been shaped in them in part through childhood experiences mm. is helpful and it matters. And then you know more about the problems that you are dealing with. And that's why the discussions that the boarding school survivors community mm. have brought to an awareness of a lot of other people are valuable. Mm. It's just that I'm not sure that a, that a lot of the wider population are yet paying attention to that because they think that's the boarding school community mm. that's different from the rest of us. And I'm trying to say it's not, yeah. it's just another example of the way in which human development can be shaped in ways that are not good for us. Mm. I need some courage. Yeah. Okay? Some of the things I'm saying take me a lot of courage because mm. I don't know who's going to get mad at me for the inconvenient things I said, or for mm. the particular words that I chose, or mm. for the people whose names I left out. Mm. But we need to be brave. We do. Both reflective and in saying no, mm. looking out for who's dangerous, if we're gonna make changes. Yeah. And every single person who's brave enough to self-reflect and to try to make changes in their system it matters. And so you and many other boarding school survivors and authors are trying to make changes within the boarding school community that some people will not want to hear that the uncomfortable things you have to say. Mm. Mm. Thank you. And I love what you say there is that I think for me, I'm seeing more my work as well as like the greater community the greater population to actually understand most it's like well it's nothing to do with me it's the 99 percent the the it's just the one percent who went to board it's like nothing to do with me but trying to understand that i was listening to i think it was joy chavron talk at a boarding school survivors conference and she was saying looking at lockdown and boarding school syndrome you know boarding school we couldn't go where we wanted you know there were certain until you were a senior you couldn't walk on certain paths. You couldn't cross the grass. The masters could. You could see your parents. And, you know, pointing out, well, that's lockdown. <laughs> that was COVID. Exactly the same. You know, Peter Levine says that, that if you were hit as a child, you're likely to hit as an adult. And the same, if you're captive as a child, you'd like <laughs> to want to make people captive as an adult. So it does impact them. And you expect people to behave, right? So if you yeah. live in a system that says you can't, the only particular kinds of people can walk on that path and other kinds of people can't walk on that path mm -hmm. and only particular kinds of people can sit at that table and other particular kinds of people can't and the kind might be an age, mm -hmm. right? Then you expect, then you experience people as divided into kinds of people mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you're supposed to behave and follow the rules. And you come to believe that that's just what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to follow the rules. Yeah. Okay. So if you are now one of the people in power, then other, like, 
and your group gets to do this, other people are supposed to follow the rules. So in other words, when you start to behave in ways that you're not supposed to, or your group behaves in ways they're not supposed to, if you've got it woven into your head that you're supposed to follow the rules, hmm. those people are inconvenient, but they're also, they don't, they don't make much sense. They don't, they don't, unless you get curious about what they're trying to say their needs are, you, you are stuck within the framework that you got given as a child or a, as a young adult. So, um, so some people have said, if we go back to the government, that you need to understand the messages that were um, being advanced at Oxford mm -hmm. when a lot of our current politicians were in their 20s. Yeah. Right? That, that, that is another crucial period. So I've talked a lot about babies and toddlerhood, mm -hmm. but that in your 20s is another crucial period of, of brain development and of your conscious understanding about where you fit in a society. Mm -hmm. And if we, at the wider public, most of whom didn't go to Oxford in the 1970s and 80s, how would you know how to think about that if you didn't have that experience? So we need to ask questions that we might not have thought to ask, which help to explain why we're having some of the societal or political struggles that we're having at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then you start to know something more about what the source of your, of your challenges, of your difficulty. And if you don't have that, then you come up with other answers to questions. If you don't have that knowledge, you come up with solutions or conclusions that might that might not be accurate about what the problem is. So understanding about human development, I think, gives us real insights and lets us ask more valuable questions than we would otherwise know to do. There is terrible, terrible pain in the accounts offered. The the autobiographies written by an awful lot of boarding school survivors. That was the thing I did not realize. So I didn't go to boarding school. Mm -hmm. And I have come to believe that actually that that is a valuable contribution to this discussion. Mm -hmm. So I now have a number of boarding school survivors who say things like, it's the first time we've been heard. So the fact that I legitimate the pain suffered by boarding school survivors when I didn't go to boarding school is clearly valuable for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that until, until people began to articulate that. I had no idea how helpful it was that I affirmed boarding school trauma. It makes perfect sense to me. It's based in attachment rifts. I understood that. And Joy Chavron and Nick Duffel have been crucial in trying to help us to understand that. And as an attachment specialist, I got that. Um, that's why I included Tony Gamage's story in my book, mm -hmm. Tigers and Teddy Bears. So his story was one amongst a number of others that talked about attachment trauma and how you can recognize it and how you can heal it. But what I did not really understand until I began reading the biographies of the people I've mentioned is how violent boarding school is mm -hmm. and how humiliating, mm -hmm. not having enough food, having food that's terrible, having boys that monitored your breathing, having, um, because most of the, and I've said boys, most of the authors, most of those biographies, autobiographies, are about, are by boys, they're mm. by men. It becomes, so Joanna Britton, mm -hmm. say we need to understand more about what happened for girls. Mm -hmm. But those recollections have helped me to understand something I did not understand. How humiliating and violent boarding schools have been right up through the 1970s and 80s and 90s. And that raises the question, are they still? And that's another, we can park that question, are they still? Mm. But that for the people who are grown-ups now, 
mm-hmm. to members of our you know, leading politicians, um, Alex Renton, Richard Beard, you know, functioning adults, the boarding schools of the 1970s and 80s were violent, scary places. Look at your eyebrows, they've gone up. Yes. So we had ACEs, mm-hmm. layer of violence and humiliation onto attachment traumas. Mm-hmm. I don't think people have understood boarding school in that way. Mm-hmm. And now we have a whole nother vision of what the impacts of boarding school are and and what we might need to do to heal and at a societal level to to think about this as a system. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'll let you take a, a breath. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think that's really key for me about trauma, isn't it? That we suppress, we hope that it will magically go away. But then I think Judith Herman talks about that, that it's in our third or fourth decade that, boom, suddenly that which we push down comes up, whether it's when our child's going off to boarding school or something happens, we break down in relationship, we lose our job. So... And so if we had more people who understood this, we might be able to give children experiences that they weren't having to repress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we might be able to find ways so that people don't have to live their lives so that they discover all of this late on. Mm -hmm. So if you're in your 40s and 50s and 60s, by the time you start to work this out, I know tons of people in their 60s mm. who that was only when they began to work it out. You've got your whole life behind you mm. in ways with consequences that are really painful to face up to. Your life could have been different mm. if you had known. Yeah. How do we help people to start to see these things earlier? Mm yeah yeah how do we do that maybe it's we yeah the work you're doing bringing more awareness to that uh, to nick duffel the simon partridges yeah Mm. so i'm wondering um you know we've covered i sent through quite a few questions and we've kind of touched on quite a lot of them but I'm wondering about um, where we kind of, what, what we delve into next. I mean, we've t- spoken a bit about how trauma works. Um, you've also spoken a bit about boarding school trauma. The, the fourth question was, you think boarding school trauma has been left out of the trauma movement? And then do you think that there needs to be a change in that great questions and can i just check how's my sound oh it's gone down right i'm going to do this that's much better okay i'm I'm working out the problem on my sound as we're talking (laughs) Okay, okay um right so bringing boarding school into the wider trauma movement Mm -hmm. i don't think boarding school has been included in the trauma movement up till now so i have been part of the growing awareness in scotland Mm -hmm. and britain because scotland is really leading in that grassroots awareness Mm and that's rippling out to England and to Northern Ireland. Um, Wales has also been a real leader in that. Um, But here in Scotland, I have been part of that growing movement since it started. So I feel like I have a pretty good sense of what kinds of conversations are had. I have never been to an event around ACEs or trauma where boarding school was mentioned was part of the conversation. Um, 
I have worked sometimes to bring it in, but for the most part, it is, it is not brought in by other people. So for me, what that says is that boarding school is not part of our thinking about what trauma is or what ACEs are. We have become much more comfortable talking about care experience, um, community, de deprived communities, communities of exclusion, poverty, dysfunctional families. So those have gained kind of a status as like legitimate trauma. Mm -hmm. We understand them as trauma. In fact, what we might fail to do is to see some of the strengths of those communities. So Darren McGarvey would tell you that, um, that lots of the communities that were, that were cleared out and, and moved beyond city borders in order to create new communities, what we did was we took away the connection that was in lots of communities of poverty. And so there, were, there are strengths of communities that we might miss. But we have come to think of those as places as places of trauma now. I don't think that has happened. The converse has happened. We don't think of boarding school as trauma because that's privilege. Mm -hmm. And so when you start to suggest that places of privilege could also carry trauma, I think that unsettles our understanding of trauma. So there will be some people who have fought hard to see how poverty can bring trauma, mm -hmm. who will be resistant to the idea that boarding school could bring trauma. How could boarding school, parents chose that for their children. How could that bring trauma? So bringing boarding school into the, to this wider discussion about trauma is unsettling, I think. Mm -hmm. And th therefore, maybe there is some resistance to it. I, I'm excited by the idea that we could bring boarding school into the umbrella of trauma because that helps us to better understand trauma itself. Mm -hmm. That helps us to see the many different ways in which children can carry suffering that we don't see because i think there are all sorts of ways we don't see children's suffering because it's hard for the grown-ups to notice it uh it just feels like it feels like normal hmm. so if it's normal it's harder to see the suffering I hope bringing boarding school into the discussion about trauma will deepen our understanding of all the different ways in which our culture um, asks children to suffer. So is that part of who Britain is? It's a place that raises a lot of children in suffering? Like that's an uncomfortable idea. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's a woman named Jane Humphreys. She says that the industrial revolution was made possible on the back of child slavery. That the Industrial Revolution depended so much on young children, young poor children, mm -hmm. uh, carrying out tasks in society that we couldn't have had the Industrial Revolution without childhood suffering. Well, you know what? Maybe we couldn't have had it without the suffering of rich children who were sent off to boarding school and that molded them into a particular kind of class. Mm. That I think that changes our ideas about what suffering is and what we do to our children as a culture. Mm. And then that helps us to think about what do we do today that our children could suffer from that we haven't realized. Mm. Mm. And how does, how does that mean that our culture, Britain, mm. differs from America or Sweden or Switzerland or Australia or are there cultures where children suffer more 
than other cultures. And are we one of those where childhood suffering is higher? Those are intriguing, uncomfortable questions. They are. They are. Yeah. It's interesting as you speak there about kind of linking in childhood slavery and especially, you know, in the 17th, 18th century. I'm sure it was Alex Renton in his, in his book talking about Eton is the, the, the dormitory at night. They used to lock the door and sometimes, you know, you'd have 18 to eight year old boys inside that dormitory. I can't remember what they called it, but often there would be dead children when they opened the door again. You know, and, and therefore these are the leaders who are going out and making the, the decisions. You couldn't have had the British Empire unless you had leaders who weren't very homesick. Mm -hmm. right? So their homesickness got taken care of when they were six and they were sent off to boarding school. Right now you go six. Children were sent to boarding school at six. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Simon Partridge, who you've had on this series, mm -hmm. was sent to boarding school at six. Yeah. Who thinks it's okay to send away a six-year-old? Good. I'm glad that people are a bit shocked by that. Mm -hmm. Simon's story matters. Mm -hmm. Right? Because then you can go, okay. So if you think six is not an okay age to send children away to boarding school, what is? Mm -hmm. Seven? Is seven acceptable? Our, you know, one-time conservative leader, David Cameron, went to boarding school at seven. Eight? Alex Renton went to boarding school at eight. Mm -hmm. Eleven? Boris Johnson went to boarding school at eleven. Thirteen? Donald Trump went to boarding school at thirteen. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just trying to pull up figures that you might, that people would recognize. Mm -hmm. Right, and then you can start to say, I don't know what age X was sent to boarding school, Y was sent to boarding school. I didn't even know that's a question that I should think about. And you might say it doesn't matter. Maybe it doesn't matter now if that is in the past. You can't change what, hap what happened in the past, but you can get curious about what the consequences are. Mm -hmm. So what are the consequences of sending a child at six or seven or eight or 11 or 13 or 16? What age should children who are going to be sent to boarding school be sent? That's a great question. And once you ask it, you can go, well, what's legal? What does the law say? What, at what age can you send a child off to boarding school? Any age you like. There is no law in Britain that says when you should send children to boarding school. There isn't? I never thought about that before. Um, okay, guidelines. What are the guidelines? Well, guidelines are culture. In this case, guidelines are whatever is normal. So if sending children to boarding school really young causes suffering to them and to the other people they interact with, I think that we should be curious about that. I think that we should think about that. And right now, there is no law that says at what age children should be sent to boarding school. And it is true, fewer children are sent at six or at eight, but there are some children who are still sent to boarding school. And now a number of them are international children who come to Britain from other countries at those young ages. Why is that legal in our country? That's a great question. It is a great question. I know people during lockdown who were at boarding school and because they were from Hong Kong, couldn't go home for those that year or so they just, they had to stay at the school. And if we can think about the suffering that might have been part of that, mm. and we can think about what suffering does to you, then we make better decisions for our children. Mm-hmm. Tom Perry, who is another of the many voices in this, and I'm delighted that so many names of people who are doing work in this area mm -hmm. entered this conversation. Tom Perry, who leads Mandate Now, makes the point that 
the legal obligations to report adults who are suspected of abusing children in various ways professionally are not in place in the way we think that they are. So we kind of have the idea that if you are suspected of abusing children, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, in boarding school, as a coach, in, um, in, in other places in which adults are in loco parentis, in charge of children, we kind of have the idea now that you have to report that. Tom Perry says, actually, the law does not provide the guarantees that we think it does. And he's really concerned about that. So he has a campaign called Mandate Now that wants to make it a law that says if people are suspected of abusing children, by law, you have to report them. Hmm. And he makes the point that that is still not in, you know, is not embedded in our legal system in the way in which we have kind of come to think it is. And we all now know that once upon a time, what happened when people were um, known to sexually abuse children in boarding school, in the Catholic church, in other institutions, is that we just moved them on. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't talked about because the system protected itself. That's what the child abuse inquiries, which have been held both in Scotland and England in the last months, have been trying to determine is did systems protect people who abused children? And the answer to that is yes. Mm -hmm. And some institutions have now become interested in how they harmed children in the past, how their system has done that. And some institutions participated in the child abuse inquiries. Mm -hmm. And it's you know, facilitated understanding the harm they had done mm -hmm. and other institutions have not. Yeah. So we prefer denial. Mm -hmm. We don't like looking at suffering and therefore the suffering remains. Alex Renton's new book about slavery is to understand how his family owned slaves and how they benefited, how he benefits from the money that was made from the suffering caused by his ancestors. Mm -hmm. And to then think about what does he do with that now? So in other words, Alex Renton has tried to step out from behind denial and to ask some hard questions. I think he's able to do that because he confronted his own boarding school experience. Mm -hmm. And if we can acknowledge the suffering that other people have experienced, then we don't leave them with it. We begin to heal the trauma that is woven into so much of our society that is at the heart of racism, that is at the heart of exclusion. Mm -hmm. We're a long way then. We're back to big issues and we're a long way from the toddler having a temper tantrum in Asda's or from the boy who can't cry because he misses his mother and he's just been sent to boarding school and he doesn't want to disappoint her so he can't tell her that he's miserable and he's not and he can't tell the teachers because they just see homesickness is normal and he'll get past it and he can't tell any of the other boys because they'll think he's weak he's left to carry the suffering on his own mm -hmm. that's not healthy for children and for human beings mm. fascinating thank you suzanne yeah i could keep going off on tangents but i'll i'll try and <laughs> stick on uh so thank you uh, really, that really helps answering that um i mean question five i mean obviously you've you've kind of talked about this quite a bit but if there's anything else you want to add in about why do you think that separation exclusion exists um 
That's a great question, Piers. And of course, when we go question five, we know what that means and the viewers don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. So you and I put together a set of questions here that we hope to explore mm -hmm. and I have gone really wide. So you're coping really well with the fact that I think in really wide ways. <laughs> and I hope that that's helpful to people because that lets us weave together themes mm -hmm. that, um, that often people don't see connections between. One of the things that we thought it might be helpful to explore in that wide framework is why I think boarding school trauma has not been acknowledged within the, the trauma movement. Mm -hmm. And I do think I do think that that has happened. So so as trauma has begun to be understood, boarding school has been excluded. And we've talked about that. So why what are the reasons? that I think the boarding school hasn't been brought under that umbrella. Um, uh, so one is how we conceive of suffering. Mm -hmm. We've used that word a lot, but what we think counts as suffering matters. Mm -hmm. So traditionally um, within the boarding school world, suffering is ennobled, right? So suffering actually, is a, a sign of your, um, it's just part of the process that it is what you do in order to become a man, mm -hmm. you need to suffer. Mm -hmm. um, and so people, there are lots of accounts actually that um, people valorized physical abuse of children. So you needed to be beaten in order to suffer enough in order to grow into the kind of man that you should be, mm -hmm. that that was part of the boarding school system. Um, and in fact, when corporal punishment was outlawed for children in state schools in the mid 1980s, it remained in the boarding school systems until about 2000. That's shocking for people, right? So children in boarding school were entitled to the same kinds of protections as children in state schools. That's shocking. But that means that the system didn't want to give it up. That means that the adults make up the system didn't want to give up abuse of children. They argued for it. So what seems obvious later is not necessarily obvious at the time in which that suffering is happening. So how do we conceive of suffering? is is one thing we need to ask and children who got whose parents paid to send them away have not i think their suffering has not been legitimized by people who experienced suffering that was not of their own choosing or of their families choosing for them so the more we can conceptualize a, suffering is happening in lots of ways i think assists us so that's one reason that I think it's been excluded. Mm -hmm. um, from that comes a kind of a legitimacy. I think that there might be some resentment that is felt by extending understanding of suffering to those children whose families paid to have this happen from the people who experienced suffering that wasn't chosen. Does that make sense? So I think there might be a resentment on some people who suffered uh, from care or from poverty or of things that they had no control over mm -hmm. to extend the idea of suffering to people where that was, in a sense, chosen. So that really pushes this, our need for compassion to, to, to really understand more deeply the experience of suffering and that it can come from a whole range of places. To get interested in others' suffering is at the heart of compassion. And what else did I say? Um, so boarding school survivors have been able to bring an awareness that lots of people who weren't at boarding school would have, and of course, power. 
if you have gained things that you see as valuable that come out of that suffering, then why would you want to reflect on it? Mm-hmm. And why would you want to give those things up? In fact, Richard Beard calls that manifest destiny, mm-hmm. which I found really helpful. Richard Beard describes it as, look, I had a lot of pain. And with that pain in childhood, I bought these outcomes. I am entitled to behave the way I am and to have the things I do. These are my manifest destiny. I bought them with my childhood pain. And so to, to think about it that way, I think helps us to understand something about entitlement, which so many people resent. Some of the powerful folks in our country it's interesting to think that that entitlement could be linked to childhood pain. Yeah. And it's interesting, as I've been kind of researching the film, the book, the idea, as I've looked through, you know, who in British society has been to boarding school. And I think Richard Beard talks about this as well, that, you know, the head of the Church of England boarding school, the head of MI6, I think they've retired now, but the head of the Telegraph, um, you know, 30% of the British Conservative Party uh, boarding school, 63% of high court judges boarding school. And it's only 1% of the population. But in these different areas, it's almost like the entitlement that you can only get the top job if you've been through this suffering or you've been to this boarding school. And if people don't know those figures and have never thought about that, why would you ask questions about the impact of childhood experiences if you don't know those figures? Mm-hmm. Once you can start to knit all this together, you can ask different sorts of questions. And although I've been talking about the questions you can ask about boarding school, let's flip it on its head. You could ask questions about the experiences of people in prison. Mm. We, our society thinks of people in prison as bad people who deserve to be locked up. Mm-hmm. Well, what John Carnican started to try to get us, and Karen McCluskey started to try to get us to ask is, what if the experiences of people in prison are based in childhood suffering? If we thought that, if we had the compassion to ask that, how might we change the system? What prevention might we be engaged in? But when we think they're just bad people, I don't have to ask those compassionate questions. And I don't mean that people in prison haven't done things that harm other people. I don't mean that it was okay. What I mean is that if I want to prevent it and I want people to heal, I need to ask other questions, just as I need to ask questions about why our politicians create policies that leave other people hungry and cold. That's cruel. Why would you do that? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, question six was, you know, what the consequences then of legitimizing the suffering of boarding school children? Well, what it does is that it lets us expand our understanding of trauma. Mm -hmm. If the privileged people get to suffer too. Mm -hmm. It's not just the people who had, well, try that again. Children who are sent to boarding school had experience thrust upon them that they didn't have any control over. So what are the consequences of dealing with experiences that are uncomfortable and painful? that you didn't have any control over at the time. How do people resolve that? What do people do with that later in in adulthood when they do have choices? How do you get to a point where you can be curious? So how do you have judges that get interested in the experiences of people in prison? Mm -hmm. How do you have people who are in boarding school who get interested in their own experiences as children so that like you, so that you decide to seek therapy. Mm -hmm. How does that compare to people 
who don't get curious about those experiences, despite the fact that they have a partner who is saying the way that our relationship is conducted is painful to me. Can you get curious enough about what your partner means? Can you get curious enough about your citizens who say we are suffering? Mm -hmm. How do you get interested in what you can't necessarily see very easily and that feel like an odd question? I think that the le legitimizing boarding school syndrome and understanding the trauma that it causes is really powerful in helping us to, to, to make that bridge to asking difficult questions because it has been so forbidden for privileged children to say that they were traumatized, to speak their pain. It is now more acceptable for children who were in care to talk about their pain. Um, there's more conversations about attachment styles. So in other words, in ordinary families, whatever that is, to talk about the way in which their attachment style got shaped by loving parents, but in ways which made emotional functioning more challenging. People who've been to boarding school who can speak about their pain, even in the midst of their privilege, I think provide a really interesting bridge mm -hmm. to helping us to ask uncomfortable questions. Mm -hmm. And I'm really grateful to all of those people who are able to tell their boarding school story in this way. Mm. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. I have on my podcast in a few weeks, um, uh, Dilibe Oniame. And when he was 22, he was the first black man to, to complete his training at Eton. He wrote a book in 1972, age 22, I think it was. And at that point, he was banned from Eton. He was told he could never go back there. And, and he was saying about the legitimizing of suffering. It was only in 2020, around the time of the Black Lives Matter, that he was issued an apology. So that was 40 years later. So having the courage to reflect on this stuff, mm. it's remarkable. Mm. But it is only through that courage that we'll be able to make change. And it's only through that courage that you understand that many of the stories and insights that are provided are inconvenient. Let mm -hmm. me say again, there will be people listening to this who are not, who find what I'm trying to say inconvenient. Mm -hmm. it's, it means that we need to look at system changes or societal changes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> If you don't have people who have the courage to continue telling their story or asking those questions in the face of resistance, there will, there will never be change. And Piers, I'm scared. I see lots of things happening in our world where that kind of questioning is being shut down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Fascism is on the rise. Mm -hmm. um, control of women is renewing. So in America, the Supreme Court is about to, it looks like, uh, change the Roe v. Wade and the, um, the legality of abortion. So Margaret Atwood, who wrote The Handmaid's Tale, said this week that when you force women to have babies that they don't want to have, that's slavery. It is. How do we bring words and frames that help us to see the things around us more clearly? It is easy to see the horror of slavery now mm. because it's the past. You know, people who happen to be a particular color were owned by other people. You could sell them. Mm. Well, when that's just ordinary, it's harder to see that. So being able to ask those questions in the present matters. Yeah. And 
people who can tell stories of boarding school pain, the pain of the privileged, matters. It's not so that we can feel sorry for people, but so that we can prevent it and so that we can heal from it. Mm -hmm. and if we could do that, we would have fewer people in prison mm -hmm. and we would help people to heal. We would prevent people getting in prison and we would have fewer people in politics who make policy that leave other people cold and hungry. Yeah. And I think all of those would be a better world. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Inspiring vision. So coming into, you know, the last few questions here, you know, you know, question seven was what questions does this stance leave us with? And this stance being, you know, about legitimizing the suffering of boarding school, I presume. Absolutely. So what are the childhood experiences of our leaders and influential members of society? Mm. I think we need to ask that more often. Mm. Um, how does the general public learn more about what trauma is and all the places that it can land? Um, how does the general public learn more about what happened for people in boarding school? Lots of people in the general public don't know anybody who is in boarding school. Mm. Or if they do know them, they don't know that they were in boarding school because very often that is kept private. Mm. So uh, boarding school experiences start to be secret. That's Alex Renton's word. Mm. How do we make them less secret so that the general public has a better understanding of what has happened? for children raised in a rather exclusionary way. Um, how do you get boarding schools to reflect mm -hmm. on the pain that they might cause? Um, again, Alex Renton tells me that he doesn't know any boarding schools that talk about attachment theory. Is Like, is that true? How would we celebrate boarding schools that might decide to get interested in attachment theory? Mm -hmm. um, have boarding schools changed now from the way they were in the 1970s and 80s? I've heard some people say that, that they're not nearly like they were because now you can text your parents. You know, you're not cut off from seeing your parents for weeks. That's true. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that the trauma of boarding school has gone away? Or is there still trauma in boarding school? I think boarding schools have a responsibility to ask that for the children that they care for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have they fulfilled that responsibility like is there pain and suffering being caused now that people don't see or that they are resistant to seeing mm -hmm. we need to those are questions that we need to ask about modern day boarding school mm -hmm. and, and finally i think if we ask more of this we could understand more about our colonial history mm -hmm. so resma minicam in america is trying to talk about how slavery is woven t into the whole of American society and it has affected both black and white people and that that black people are much more aware of it than white people so in other words you cannot confront racism in America without confronting the slavery period yeah. what if you can't con come to terms with the British colonial period and all of the consequences that that has meant for all of the world mm -hmm. without thinking about boarding school trauma. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So the more we legitimate boarding school trauma, the more we can address a whole range of really important big questions. Mm -hmm. In addition to the healing that is meant for individuals who went to boarding school. Yeah, that's fascinating, actually. Thought of that. Yeah, the colonial way and the, how that links into slavery and then boarding school style. Yeah, I think Nick Duffel says beautifully this idea of, um, you know, the British were great at suppressing the inner indigenous. Isn't that interesting? And then some people will go, I don't even know what that means, the inner indigenous. Yeah. What if it means? that British culture thinks that repressing feelings is a good idea. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Like, is that true? Are we uncomfortable with feelings? Yeah, stiff upper lip. <laughs> we really value independence. So again, going wide. And I know we've just like carried on. I've just treated this as a conversation. Mm, right. I haven't like tried to re restrict myself to tight answers so that we would finish quickly. And I hope that the viewers have liked that. Um, and I know I tend to go wide and that will be obvious to anybody listening to this, but let me go wide again. Mm -hmm. There are in England right now, there are new guidelines about early years care. Okay. It's called the early years framework for children in state schools. And that early years framework celebrates independence. So it talks about all the ways that early years care can support the development of children's independence. Never once in that document is the word dependence used. I know because I've counted up the words in it. And the reason that matters is it tells us something about culture that our, that the early years system in Britain, in England, celebrates independence, not dependence. Still, you know, they came into a force last year. I like your eyebrows. You know, your eyebrows are sort of like going, why? Yeah. Yeah. What John Bowlby tried to help us to understand with attachment theory and all the attachment theorists that have come after that and contemporary theorists like Bruce Perry and Dan Siegel, Judith Herman, who you've mentioned, um, is that you can't have healthy independence without healthy dependence. They go together. So when you are struggling with big feelings, you need to know that you can seek help from someone else. And if you don't believe that you are entitled to do that, then you can't be vulnerable in relationships and that means that there is a distance a guard between you and other people you can't have a really thrive emotionally thriving marriage if you don't trust your partner if you aren't able to emotionally trust and turn to them and share who you are mm -hmm. i mean at one level is that not obvious yeah yeah, yeah. Tons of people survive in relationships where they aren't really known to their partner, where they don't think they can ask for help. Mm -hmm. And I use the word thrive, survive, not thrive. Yeah. Right? So do we want relationships where you survive or do you want relationships where you thrive? Mm -hmm. Well, if you want relationships where you can thrive, then you need to have dependence as well as independence. Mm -hmm. How can you have dependence if it's not even in your guidelines, if you don't know that that's a valuable thing? So that's a contemporary cultural example of something that I think ripples all the way back to and relates to boarding school. Boarding school is the height of resilient independence. It's not, it's not resilient independence. It's emotional atrophy. It's repressed dependence. You can't have healthy independence if you have repressed dependence. Okay, but that requires major cultural unpacking. Mm -hmm. But if Britain's capacity to repress its emotions and its connection to other people lies at the heart of the colonial period. You, you start to have a sense of the cruelty and damage that was done, mm -hmm. that it was embedded in, in, a lack, in a lack of attendance to the suffering that you were causing. And you thought you were entitled to do that because that's what boarding school had taught to its leaders. Okay, the colonial period is done. We can't undo that, but we could heal from it. 
So the, the, calls, the calls for healing in the Caribbean, well, at the heart of that is understanding the suffering that was caused. And the hearing of, of that suffering. So the, the healing of trauma is an acknowledging pain. And that can happen at an individual level or at a family level or at a societal level. So we could start by healing some of the pain caused by the colonial period by listening to the suffering that was left over in India, in the Caribbean, in the other places of, in, in Australia. Mm, yeah. So listening to suffering. Yeah. But often you can't listen to suffering because the story that the person is telling you is too hard. Mm. Helen Bamber ran a uh, charity where she listened to the experiences of people who had been in war. And she said at the heart of it, before she died, uh, lots of people might not know her name, before she died, one of the key statements she made was that all she really did was listen. But she listened to the stories that, of suffering that no one else had been willing to listen to. And that in the listening, the healing happened. So at one level, it's not hard to start healing and to help other people to heal. We just have to be willing to listen, but we're very often not willing, indeed not able to do that. So let's get better at our listening skills. Alex Renton's book about slavery is an example of that. He's willing to listen to the suffering his family caused and that he benefited from. All these years later, he benefits from that suffering. So he acknowledges that and he's willing to tell the rest of the world by writing a book about it. But he tells me that he gets an awful lot of abuse every time he goes, he speaks publicly about that book. So there are a lot of people who don't want him to talk about that. It requires courage to continue telling that story. Mm, thank you. I almost feel that um, it's like these people who have the courage to stand up and speak almost you know it's like this need this network of people to go no keep going to support each other it's like come on you're doing great absolutely it, it is easier to tell those stories when you're not having to tell those stories alone mm -hmm. when there's a community of people around you so the footballers who've taken the knee in front of crowds that called them names and humiliated them and in front of politicians who humiliated them are brave people. Good for them. You keep taking the knee. What you're trying to do is speak to suffering that has been caused and that is not acknowledged. And boarding school is great at teaching children to deal with suffering by laughing at it, by making fun of it, by humiliating you out of it. And we can see that around us in a lot of political culture in Britain. In yeah. fact, we see that in the, in the chamber. Yeah. Prime Minister's questions is full of humiliation and making fun. That we call that debate. <laughs> debate. It's humiliating debate. Yeah. Boarding school helps you perfect those skills. Mm -hmm. It teaches you how to do that. Is that the kind of society that we want that deals with feelings through humiliation? Okay, well, do we? Don't we? What kind of society do we want? You will create a society through the way you treat your children. Hmm. Yeah. And our children today have now been changed by COVID. Mm. Okay, so our youngest children have had experiences that are not like the experiences of children born in 2019. So right. there's lots of evidence, just going back to the youngest one, let alone the teenagers, there are lots of evidence now 
that speech and language skills have been impaired, the capacity to socialize comfortably has been impaired. Children will have learned that other adults are dangerous. Okay, they're carrying that in their understanding of people and in their stress system. This week on Twitter, there's been a big discussion about whether we should exclude five-year-olds for bad behavior. These five-year-olds lived through COVID. So there are some people trying to help people to understand this, to think about the experience of children in COVID. In other words, we have a lot more stressed children. We have a lot more stressed children. Can I? If enough children in our culture have been stressed as two and three year olds and children born during lockdown, then our culture changed. And that is going to carry on as those children get older. We could make a difference now if we tune in, if we change our systems, if we give them time to learn to just be with other peers. If we don't do that, we deepen the experiences of distress that they've already had. I know that we don't get that or we would not be having a discussion about whether we should exclude five-year-olds for their behavior. Yeah. Boarding school, because of the extremity of it, the extremity of the, you have a system that is built intentionally not to listen to children's pain and to mm -hmm. valorize that pain and to, and to think that you need to cause children that pain. The extremity of that helps us to see more clearly the suffering of all children. And I hope that the people listening to this who have experienced boarding school pain see the, see the strength of their ability to tell their story, not just for the boarding school community, but well beyond that. Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. As I shared before we began, uh, the Telegraph interviewed me last week. And the day after, I had all of this fear come up about, oh, you know, I've spoken, I'm not allowed to speak, and just that terror. And then it passed. And nothing had happened because it's not gone out, the article. But it's like, wow, just that you do not speak up. You do not. And... Yeah, and what I'm hearing from you is, yes, it's okay to speak up because people need to know about this now. It's okay to speak up and mm -hmm. it takes courage to speak up. And if other people know that it takes courage to speak up, then it helps them to speak up in their own areas. So sometimes it looks really easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if it looks easy when I talk about this to people. You know, I do it with passion. Um, I can cite the names of important theorists who've added to this. I have some education to go with it. Maybe it looks easy. I'm often scared when I'm talking about this stuff because I know it is inconvenient for other people. Maybe I should talk more, more about the courage. <clears throat> See, can you hear my voice? Mm -hmm. I just talked about how I'm scared and my throat has started to do different things. <clears throat> Un <clears throat> Understanding that you, that we carry that stress in our bodies helps. So your body carries terror mm -hmm. and you spoke out when you spoke to the telegraph and you did a thing that boarding school had trained you never to do. Don't snitch. Don't tell anybody. So you've had to do something that your body doesn't really want you to do. And the day after your body complained, <laughs> you had a wave of terror. Where we understand what is happening in our own bodies lets us do different 
things. It, it passed. It didn't stay with you, but it was uncomfortable while it was happening. The more, the more we understand those embodied processes, the more we are able to do the things that are scary. And if we understand that tackling this carries with it fear, then maybe we find ways to carry on anyway. So, so every single person who tells a story about how they made change, how head teachers changed their behavior policies, or how parents apologized to their children for the pain they caused them, or how um, individuals learn to become more self-compassionate, or I don't know, maybe there will be a boarding school that on the basis of this conversation says, maybe we need to know about attachment theory and decides to find some way to do that. And then says aloud, we're a boarding school who is interested in attachment theory. Mm-hmm. Doing that lets change ripple out to others. So peers, I think it's helpful to people to know not only that you spoke to the telegraph, but that it took you courage to speak to the telegraph and that afterwards the terror welled up in your body and then it passed. I think that's helpful for people to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I esteem your courage and your ability to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 By Saturday it passed by Friday, my brain, it was like cortisol. Just I couldn't really think it's like, what's happening? Why am I feeling this terror? And it's like, okay, yeah, you learn. And I think I, yeah, we're kind of diverging, but yeah, thank you. I appreciate your, 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 your words. So, I mean, starting to wrap this up a bit, I mean, the last question is really is, is it possible to heal from boarding school trauma? In your Absolutely. Life? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Our testament to that. Well, I mean, what would you say? Is it possible to heal? Definitely. Definitely. You know, as Judith Herman says, it's like it's an ongoing process. But, you know, from being suicidal and trying to take my own life in my 20s and being deeply miserable, you know, now it's like, yeah, I feel a lot of joy. Um, so, yes, it's possible. It is always possible to heal from childhood trauma. Always, always, always. That doesn't mean that you will bounce back and you'll be like you would have been if that hadn't happened. That's not what healing is. Healing is about experiencing more joy, is about thriving more, is about seeing that your wounds are your strengths, is about taking better care of yourself, is about when you're hit with a wave of terror, not believing that that you're going to die so on saturday you're okay but on friday it was a terror day mm-hmm. but knowing that it will pass means that you don't that you take more care of yourself on that friday mm-hmm. and that you don't think this will last forever so you can continue to make choices that help you to thrive and help others so you haven't called up the journalist on the Friday and said, I retract everything I said, take it back. I'm not telling you my story. Mm-hmm. Where some part of your system might have preferred you to do that on the Friday. That was my wife <laughs> saying, no, no, keep going, please. <laughs> okay, so your wife helped hold you in a moment of fear. Yeah. Your capacity for dependence helped. Mm-hmm. If you had been unable to trust your wife, or you didn't have a wife in your life at all, maybe you would have called the telegraph back and said, I take it all back. You can't print any of that. Mm -hmm. And then no one else will be able to benefit from your story. Mm -hmm. So when we're struggling, we need somebody to help us. And I tell you, I interview people in prison quite often who have no idea that what happened to them was trauma. Mm -hmm. They have no idea that, there, there could be any link between whatever they're in prison for and the story that they just told me about their childhood. They don't know it's traumatic. In the same way that lots of people in boarding school don't know that what happened to them was trauma. Mm-hmm. 
what is usually key in their story is um, a story of independence and um, that they're fine on their own. So part of healing is being able to be in touch with your vulnerabilities and knowing that you can trust other people. You can learn to do that in your adulthood, but it will take some courage and some work. <clears throat> And hearing the stories of other people who have healed from childhood trauma inspires other people to know that there is hope and helps us to remain vigilant about people who are dangerous to us who have not yet got interested in their childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. Some of whom will be in prison, some of whom will not be in prison, and some of whom will be in politics. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's a story of hope, Pierce. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. understanding trauma is fundamentally a story of hope. It helps mm -hmm. us to know that healing is possible, but mm -hmm. it's only possible because you get interested in doing that healing. Yeah, and it's yeah. based in listening. Yeah, to yeah. yourself and to others. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Suzanne. And I guess before we do finish, I'd love just to, to share your vision moving forward as a, you know, a leader in this field. It's like, what's your vision for the next five years? Let's put that out into the collective of what's going to unfold. And... Well, I think that I would like a world where there is less childhood suffering. Mm which at one level sounds a bit naive and also impossible. I think it's possible. And I think the only way that it can come about is if I keep talking and other people keep talking. I would like me to be rendered um, irrelevant. I would like me to be drowned out by all the other voices of people who also get this. Because the damage that we do to each other as human beings, our capacity to see each other's suffering is based in the damage that is done to us as children. So it is unacknowledged, unresolved trauma that does the most damage. Um, I am hopeful because lots of people are talking about this. I used to think I need to do more and more and more. I don't think that anymore. I now think I just need to stay. I just need to keep doing this. I need to keep myself well enough to just keep saying the same things. I just say the same things over and over and over again. And my job is just to keep saying them. Um, my job is also to help other people to feel confident enough to tell their stories and to get curious about how trauma works. That's my job. That's my self-elected job. And I am hopeful because there are lots more people talking about childhood trauma in just the last five years than there were before. At the same time, fascism is on the rise. There are, there are more children in Britain who are cold and hungry than there were in 2019 before the kind of policies that have got brought in in Britain in just the last 12 months. Um, in Afghanistan this week, the women have been made to wear the burqa. Ukraine is now at war. So there is a, there's a new war that wasn't underway in, in January 1st of 2022. So it's not, it's not like the understanding ripples out and has an impact automatically. The understanding of trauma and the power of hope that it brings is only put into place because people choose to put it into place because people are brave enough to change their systems, to stand up and tell their stories. And I think our world needs it. 
very badly. Mm, thank you, Suzanne. Thank you for your amazing work and yeah, very inspiring. And how do people get in touch about you, find out more? Ah, uh, well, there's a, there are web, there's a website. In fact, there's two websites. Um, so there's, um, my own website, SuzanneZedike.com. Um, and there's also my organization, which is Connected Baby. So connectedbaby.net. Yeah. Um, so their websites, uh, that they're, they're both on Twitter, they're both on Facebook, um, through Connected Baby, we produce a small range of resources to help people to get that. So, you know, that's mm. my book, Saber Tooth Tigers and Teddy Bears, in which I tell Tony Gamage's story yeah. and lots of other stories and talk about, um, talk about trauma using this language of Saber Tooth Tigers and Teddy Bears, which sounds a bit silly. And some people think a scientist shouldn't use such language. I think it's great. <laughs> but I find that that metaphor helps people to get it. Mm -hmm. so your saber tooth tiger system is when you're scared and your teddy bear system is when you can feel safe mm -hmm. you need to be able to cycle between those people who are traumatized their default becomes their system of fear mm -hmm. their saber tooth tiger system um how do we help people to get out of that how what happens if you have people in power who are based in that system mm -hmm. and therefore are taking decisions that cause more fear for others. Uh, so we have a range of resources that you can find on Connected Baby, both films and books. And um, I do lots of work with Ace Aware Nation in Scotland. We're having a conference on prisons mm -hmm. on the 1st of June. So working with lots of partners to bring, how do you change the prison system so that it becomes more compassionate? Mm -hmm. so underpinning all of that is a question how do you take the science of connection and help the public to understand it that is my question to myself and you can do that through events you can do that through writing books you can do that through making films you can do that through creating animations you can do that through creating musicals we have a musical called the little iceberg Okay. which we're about to have a, a run of. Um, so that's in a really creative way through music and dance. You can use that to t understand trauma. Yes. What we need to be is as creative as possible in helping people to understand the impact of childhood experiences, to take them seriously, and to find language and forms that help people to get curious about that. So I'm just trying to give a flavor of the way in which myself and my team and my partners all work. Mm -hmm. um, if that inspires other people to find creative ways for them to tell stories and to spread this information, then that becomes a form of courage. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your courage in doing this work. And I'll put your links into the description so people can can get in touch or visit uh, you know go to some of your workshop i myself attended one a few weeks ago a talk it was amazing so i really do recommend you you learn more about attachment theory especially from suzanne so thank you so much and i will press stop but if we stay on the call to uh, just debrief and all that but thank you so much for the amazing work and your conversation today fascinating it has been such a pleasure to be with you, Piers. It was a real delight just to have a conversation rather than frame things. So I hope that it gives people lots to take away. I appreciate the curiosity of anyone who wants to talk about this stuff. I think everyone deserves to know it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>